Hello everyone and welcome to our, our virtual library when we are today are joined by Natalie Hayes and uh, she is the author, a classicist, a broadcaster, stand-up comedian, it's anything you don't do. <laughs> and yeah, um, really much loads of things. <laughs> and uh, she's also the author of this amazing book, Eight Thousand Ships. So um, thank you very much for jo joining us today and agreeing to talk to us. Um, My pleasure. Please, please tell me more, if you can sum the book in a couple words, what would that be? Um, I guess it's, um, it's the Trojan War, but told from the perspectives of not quite all, but an awful lot of the women involved in it. I had really wanted for a long time to write an epic um, and uh, I felt very strongly that war was something which um, we tended to focus on men's experience of rather than women's experience of it. And when you got novels which focused on women's experience, it tended to just be sort of one woman or a family. And that's quite a domestic setting. And I thought, what happens if you take the story of the war and tell it from all the women's perspectives, all those goddesses who start it and, and make it worse, all those Trojan women who survive it but are trafficked, enslaved at the end of the war, all those Greek women waiting for their husbands to come back or not in some cases, the, the Amazon women who fight at Troy. What happens if you tell this, this war just from the women's stories? What will happen to it? And the answer is you can get a, a really rounded view of the war, I think, across yeah. this enormous kind of scope. And I thought, I don't, I, it took me a really long time through writing it. It was about two thirds of the way through before I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not writing tragedy anymore, which is generally what I tend to write. I'm writing epic. And I was like, oh, <laughs> but, but it felt like a really nice thing to, to sort of say to myself. I'm like, yeah, no, women's stories are, are big. They're not just one woman, two women. They're, it's dozens of women. This war affects dozens of women. And, yeah. and that was the story I wanted to tell. But what I really loved about your book, it started from the very, 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 very beginning, even before the whole war was done. It started with a... Um, one of the um, goddesses being uh, really, you know, holding a grudge was not being invited to the wedding. <laughs> right. I mean, if you follow it back, it goes back and back yes. and back and back. Yes. And back. And it's, yeah. it's, all so. about the, it's all touched by the women. And to be honest, what I yes. love about your book as well is just it's not really about men anymore. Men are sort of like a standbys, and those who are sort of like, sort of, okay, they do the fighting and they do the horrible things afterwards. But it's really about the women and how. In a way, it's all started about the women. It's you know not even the, the Helen, but it's just even before. Yeah. And it finishes, and it goes and goes obviously uh, way after the Trojan War is actually finished. Right. And we are able to find out a tiny bit histories of those women who who were involved. This is what I absolutely love that. How yeah, did you sort I think of, it's a really was that your was that your was that your idea from the beginning? Always, yeah, from the very beginning. What I wanted to do, and I wrote a page. I should dig it out to prove it. I wrote a page for Pan Macmillan because I'd written the Children of Jocasta, and um, my agent wanted, and I wanted to sell it with another book, which I had yet to write. And they said, "Can you write us a page on what the new book will be?" And I said, "Yeah, sure. It's going to be the." And I basically wrote just a single side of paper. I said. It's going to be the Trojan War, but it's going to be told from the perspective of its women. And there's going to be a causation timeline that runs backwards and a consequences timeline that runs forwards. And it's going to flip point of view every single chapter. And they went, OK, <laughs> it's, like, it's going to be fine. Don't worry. Um, and so I'd always intended that the, I always wanted to start it with the horse because I think that's the most well-known bit of the story is the Trojan horse and I thought yeah. I've got to give people something they can get their hands on that they definitely know yeah. and then I can take it back from there and forwards from there because they'll know that point the point where the horse makes it into the city that's the bit that everybody knows at least in the UK I think it's it's our most famous bit of the story if I ask the question in Cyprus it's Achilles is the most famous bit of the story but for us I think it's it's the horse um and so I thought I'll start with that and then I can just run that causation timeline backwards. But I want to follow the stories of what happens to all these Trojan women after the war, because I think it's a really, it's a really tempting mistake to make, to think that war happens just on the battlefield. And of course, the Iliad um, is, is, doesn't make that mistake. You know, a lot of the Iliad is, is battlefield scenes, but a lot of it isn't. There's a reason why it's called the Iliad. Ilios is the is a poetic name for Troy. It's the poem of the city. 
it's not just about the war outside the city walls it's about the city and the society within that men and women alike um the greek camp is highly individualistic highly masculine but troy is is a is a working city of of men and women when hector goes back to troy in book six of the iliad he bumps into his mum she talks to her female friends he sees his sister-in-law helen he sees his wife andromache so lots of women appear in the story but the, the focus isn't on them the focus is on the men because it's a war narrative and i thought this is a huge i saw this incredibly harrowing documentary in Cannes a really long time ago 2009 i think which was about restorative justice in rwanda and um i was seeing it for work i was there to review it and it was incredibly upsetting um as you would expect such a film to be and the, i was really struck by the kind of disparity between the press materials and the film and that's that's not unusual as you know when you get a press release that they don't fit but the press release said and i'm slightly paraphrasing this now it's sort of based um here's this story which is going to show us how these yeah you know, people have kind of forgiven the people who've committed these terrible atrocities and i watched the film and i thought doesn't look like they're forgiving them to me to me it looks like these women and it was focused on women are carrying these appalling physical and emotional scars with them and although the war is over um it's, not in terms of, it's, it's really not over for them yeah. and i thought it's a huge mistake to think that the war ends when someone dies that's just when the battle ends but the war will will reverberate for so long and so that was the that was the, the the most random thing was you know out of all the inspiration all those greek texts i've been reading since i was a teenager and i started studying greek actually that that film about rwanda was as, as formative as as anything else it's like what happens afterwards what happens after the battle finishes what happens after a man has died is we tend to think oh that's the end of that story no it isn't because he's got a mother a or a son or a wife yeah. or yeah. you know yeah there are people waiting for him and he's not going to come home what happens to them and the iliad just throws throws us that at the end hector obviously spoiler 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 hector dies in book 22 of the iliad so there are still two more books and the, the iliad ends with his funeral with the city coming together to bury him and at his funeral, his, his mother speaks, and then his widow, and then his sister-in-law, and then his father. And so it's a very family-oriented, it's, you know, it's not grand men who fought alongside him coming to talk about how brave he is, although Andromache, his wife, widow, does. It's, it's his family. It's, it's, and Helen particularly gives this incredible speech where she talks about how, how much she loved him as a brother-in-law and how caring he was and how he always was nice to her. And of course, you could read it sceptically and say, oh, typical Helen, it's all about her. It's all about how he behaves to her. But actually, I read it anyway as, as you know, this is, that we need to know this side of Hector too. He's not just a warrior, he's a man. And, and that's true of everybody who fights, is they're not just who they are on the battlefield. They're a person before and after that. And when people are doing incredibly brutal things, it's very, very easy to forget that, that they're a human being because they're doing something monstrous, but they aren't monsters. If they were monsters, it would be easier to understand. It would be like the weather, right? A terrible thing happens and it's, you know, huge, but we can comprehend it. It's just random. It's not Well, though. in a way you can sort of, in a way you sort of can forgive the Trojans for actually fighting and killing Greeks because they're sort of fighting for their own home. It's right. not them who actually came and sort of, you know, and, and, and started fight. It's, it's the, it's the, it's the Greeks that come in and, and uh, you know, and, and they're on their own grounds. So yes. obviously, you know, that this is this is a thing to me more that's why it's more tragic. This is you know, none of these women wanted the the war really. It's just they've none been a victims of someone else's um choices and yeah, you know, exactly. and how tragically that they finished at the end for some of them. But what I really liked about your book, you said you wanted to write a tragedy, but um you end up with the ep epic epic story about um all the women. So so what I really liked is the there's a place or a bit of a humor as well in it and a bit yeah. of a, like a soft touch absolutely and all that because otherwise it would be just too sad to read it would be too sad yeah no i thought of, of a couple of things really the first is that the choruses in a greek tragedy give you a, a, a sort of counterpoint to the plot the plot is so inexorable and it's always so terrible or almost always um and then you get these beautiful poetic interludes where the chorus sings a lovely ode to something and those moments when you saw the play staged originally would have been 
musical you know they would have been sung and danced and so it would have been a, a musical number it would have given you at least some even if they're very serious it would have still been a Just sort a of, of a like relief exactly a bit of an emotional relief and then epic too you get those moments where you're like wait is that actually a joke did you just did that was there a joke there and certainly the odyssey is full of moments which are really pretty funny um you know that the iliad obviously is a more serious narrative because it's it's war and lots of people die but lots of people die in the odyssey <laughs> um everyone except spoiler spoiler every ithacan except odysseus doesn't make it home yeah. so you know the death toll in the Odyssey is is almost entire, <laughs> and and then when he gets back, he kills all those suitors plus the ten women who he believes have conspired with them. But of course they are slaves, so they don't have any choice. So it's an incredibly bloody conclusion to to the Odyssey, and yet we think of it as a relatively kind of nice, fun story that children might read. And you know, oh, when Odysseus blinds the Cyclops, you go, wait for a minute. He actually pokes out the only with a burning stick. How is this a fun story? Oh, he's a monster. Wait, who made that rule? And so I thought, you know, that there it's it's always been the case, as long as these stories have existed, it's been the case that they have have bound those two elements together, that comedy and tragedy exist at the same time. And I figured Aristotle doesn't have a problem with that. You know, he knows that catharsis can come either side you know it can either be from laughing at the misfortunes of others in comedy or it can be from rehearsing our own misfortunes in tragedy and i thought well if it's good enough for aristotle i'll give it a go what's the worst that can happen i can only fail nobly and so that's better than failing without trying i'll try that so is this what the um penelope's uh, letters are about because this was my i don't know do you have a favorite person in this big because i think penelope oh, was mine yeah because that's really penelope was mine. The Penelope Letters are based on um, Ovid's Heroides. It's a collection of beautiful poems, which I can see that you know, but they're not particularly well known and they should I know ever... them. I know them because you did this amazing Ovid, not oh. Ovid, on, oh, uh, not on Instagram. Yeah. So I if anyone, doing... sorry, if anyone oh. want to know more about Penelope and in fact Ovid and um, listen to Natalie, um, basically doing what she does the best is basically talking about the ancient history and the ancient Greek history please do check them out they're amazing I love them and oh, yes and that Penelope that's I was wondering if you based them on that I did yeah so Ovid's um, Herodes for those of you who haven't been uh, tuning into Ovid not Covid every Wednesday morning but you should be um we're at number can't remember 13 now or something but they're all lurking up on the Facebook fan page they're all you can track them down on Twitter and Instagram if you want them um but they are letters written, imagined by Ovid, written um, from the abandoned women of Greek myth, reworked for a Roman audience, because he's writing in the first century, uh, at the very end of the first century BC into the first century CE, but they're an early work, very probably an early work. Um, and they are letters written from these abandoned women to their absent menfolk. And the first of those letters is from Penelope to her husband. Well, in Greek, we call him Odysseus, but she is a Roman version, so she calls him Ulysses. Um, and of course, he's been gone for 20 years. He's gone for 10 years fighting a war and then 10 more years getting home, which we always think of as being the great adventure narrative. But it's worth bearing in mind he spends one of those 10 years living as the husband of Circe and seven of those 10 years living as the husband of Calypso. So it is a bit like a 10 year adventure, but it's quite a lot more like an eight year affair plus a bit of seafaring to get to those two separate locations. <laughs> it was like, oh. And I thought it was so, I love, I love Ovid's Herodes. I've always loved them. Um, and I would love to do a set of them as short stories, but there's no market for short stories in the UK as everyone always tells me. So, uh, so far I haven't persuaded anyone to let me Fingers do it. But crossed. One day, I know it'd be so much fun to do. Um, and so when I came to the Penelope show, I was convinced when I started Ships that I would tell the Odysseus part of the story um, from the perspectives of all the women of the Odyssey and I thought this is going to be so much fun because there's Circe and Calypso and Scylla and Charybdis and the Sirens and you know loads of the Nausicaa, um, there's I think the, the daughter and, and queen of the Lystragonians, I was like this, this is going to be great and then two things happened, the first Three things happened. The first was I wasn't sure how I could do the voice of Charybdis because that's just a whirlpool going blood blood. <laughs> the second was that I thought it actually was maybe too many voices. There are already so many voices of the Trojan women, the Greek women, the goddesses, and I thought even 
even though I think I'm making this pretty clear, and even though we're going to have a list of characters at the start so you can look back so you won't get lost in the story, this might be a step too far for a, a, a reader who's not very highly versed in the Odyssey Did already. Did you have to get rid of someone else that you wanted? You know what happened is I wrote the first letter from Penelope um, and I thought well Penelope's going to have to tell the story of Polyphemus of the Cyclops being blinded because I don't I don't want a masculine voice to tell this story so I'll let Penelope do it and then we can move on to Circe and I got to the end of Penelope's first letter and I thought I can't give her up I'm going to have to keep doing it I loved her so much I was like oh no she can do all of them don't worry everyone it's fine and then of course she gets crosser and crosser as as the book goes on so the first letter she's like oh my darling Odysseus take care you're on your way home and then as it goes on she's like well I've heard that you're living with someone as her husband and that definitely can't be right and then and by even, the those, even one, those beginnings of the letters even those beginnings of the letters say dearest husband dear Odysseus hi what's up <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah I'm afraid yeah I know you're always supposed as a writer to be able to kill your darlings and and it's the opposite of that I loved her so much I just couldn't I couldn't put her down and I'm still a little bit yeah a bit of me it's like oh I think of all that you know it would have been so much fun to do the sirens singing to Odysseus it would have been so much fun and then I was like no I can't I love Penelope she gets to stay so I don't exactly have a favorite but Penelope was the most fun to write probably and also inexplicably Cassandra I loved writing because she's so sad it's such a sad part of the story um and I just for the people her. who might not know who is Cassandra Cassandra is one of the daughters of Priam and Hecabe so she's a princess of Troy and she has been cursed with what I would describe as one of the most innovatively cruel curses in all of Greek myth which is saying something by the way um she is cursed by Apollo to see the future but never to be believed so she always knows what's coming. And bear in mind, her future is horrifying because her city is going to fall and everyone she loves is going to be either killed or enslaved. Um, and she knows that's coming for the duration of the war and she can't tell anyone, they just assume she's mad. So she is both cursed to this horrific foresight and additionally, everyone thinks she's insane. She can't talk to anybody. So it's incredibly isolating as a, as a curse and I've always loved her and I've always found her sadness very real it's quite moving as well so so yeah her not she's being, very so, real. yeah not she's being very grown very in the present it's just her mind um going as I think as we go along as well yeah I mean it allowed me to follow the other parts of the Trojan story forward so she is it's through Cassandra's eyes that we see what happens with Hecabe who commits one of the most horrific acts of revenge in all of Greek tragedy and all of Greek myth actually um, and poses a really interesting question which is can a victim of violence also be a perpetrator of violence? Uh, yes! <laughs> She's like oh my god! You know she has this horrific experience as Queen of, as queen of Troy and her husband is killed kneeling at an altar just horrific and incredibly blasphemous and all of those things almost all of her sons have been killed in the war her daughters are all being enslaved and then she discovers a terrible, terrible additional loss and the revenge she takes is, is extraordinarily brutal. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that story is the story of an older woman doing something horrific. It just feels like you never get to see it. Women are become invisible at a certain age. I'm like, well, that's not going that doesn't happen with Hecabe. So come on. But I wanted to be able to show that that story play out from the from the present tense as it were of the book which is the, the women on the shore the day after the the city has fallen and so it's through cassandra's capacity to see the future that we follow um follow hecabe and and indeed follow andromache to her um the end of her story so yeah yeah it's quite a lot of it's quite a lot of intense moments in there as well it is quite a lot of intense moments if you listen to the audiobook you can hear me cry at one point which is not very professional <laughs> Yeah. Um, do you think you can read this book if you don't know much about mythology? I know I really you've got, this, so. you've got yeah, this, really um, a very handy uh, list of characters, which made me smirk at the you know at some points. <laughs> Lots of tea for current. Yeah. Of um, but do you think that people are becoming more interested in the mythology and the Greek mythology in recent days? There have been people kind of plugging away with retelling Greek myth the whole time um not least incredible poets like carol ann duffy with things like the world's wife her version of eurydice is one of my very favorite 
um, versions full stop. I just think it's so brilliant. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's perhaps partly because it's so much harder to study classics in schools than it used to be and than it should be. Um, but because of that, because there's been a, a sorrowful decline in studying of Latin and Greek, there has nonetheless been a sort of little upturn in people studying classical civilization, which is um, ancient history and myth and literature in translation. And so I think lots and lots of students who maybe wouldn't have got to do any classics at all or would have just done Latin, which I love. I'm very much in favour of people studying. Everyone should study. Everyone should get to study Latin if they would like to. But they are now maybe not getting to study Latin. Massive boo and hiss. But they are getting to study classics in translation, which means that they maybe do Homer or tragedy as a paper, um, which means they get a bigger overview of, of mythology. So I think... There's probably an element of that. There's certainly a real sense, at least for me, I published The Ancient Guide to Modern Life, which is my first nonfiction book about the ancient world, uh, 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years ago in November. And ever since then, I've had letters and emails and messages from people who didn't get to study classics at school, usually because they were they failed an exam at some stage. So they failed the 11 plus and they had to go to the wrong kind of school where they weren't allowed classics, where the right kind of children did get to study classics. And they have felt like that for their whole lives. Like they somehow failed the ancient world and weren't entitled to it. And I can't tell you how both angry and sad that makes me because classics belongs to all of us. This is all our ancient history. Um, this is all our myth. These are all our cultural foundation stones of some of them anyway and we're all entitled to those stories and if if we convince children that they're not good enough for classics we're doing them a huge disservice and quite aside from anything else we're being incredibly dishonest you know it's everybody's and and we're entitled to it and i get letter after letter and have done for a decade now from people who who waited their whole working lives sometimes before they retired and then did their, their open university degree in Latin. I had one letter from a woman who'd started Latin at 60, and then she'd got her degree at, I don't know, 64, 65, part-time, and then she thought, you know what, I'm going to do Greek. Uh, fine. Why not? And, and she mailed me, she was in her 80s doing her PhD in Greek, and you go, good for you, and you should not have had to wait this long. You just shouldn't have. Classics is there for you whenever you want it in any form. You know, people always say, oh, is this good enough? Is that good enough? Are these, you know, are the Stephen Fry books good enough for my child to read? Or is it, it's like, it doesn't, I don't care if you only read Percy Jackson. I don't care if you read Stephen Fry. I don't care if you read Mary Renner. I don't, I'm not impressed if you're just reading papyri from Oxyrhynchus that are stored in Oxford. It, any kind of classics is yours and you must enjoy it, I hope but you at least deserve access to it. It belongs to us. So I don't mind if you listen to my radio show. I don't mind if you read my books. I don't mind if you watch the Ovid Not Covid videos. I don't mind if you don't do any of them and ignore me and just watch, you know, something else. Watch Bethany Hughes following the, the footsteps of Odysseus or the, whatever you do on a boat that's not walking. Um, the oar steps of Odysseus on Channel 5 right now. I don't mind how you get your classics. I just want you to have the option if you would like it. I will link the um, both... Um, uh, of it, not COVID, um, and the uh, stand up, you, uh, sorry, not stand up, the, the program on BBC4 you're doing as well. Yeah, because yeah. both of them are brilliant. And and I think this is, it's only a nice start for people who want to learn a bit more about ancient Greek history, I suppose, as well. I really hope so. Yeah, I really hope so. The, the radio show has, we've just finished Series 6 for Radio 4, and we recorded Series 6 in lockdown. And so that is about Greek myth. But the first five series were about historical figures from Greece and Rome and Carthage and you know, various other ancient worldy places. Um, and uh, it's, it's a huge, it, it, it takes so long to make each episode. It takes so much work to research them and get them all kind of shiny and, and easy to access. But I hope it's worth it because then people can just tune in. I think it's been lots of people's lockdown listen, you know, so that's lovely. Excellent choice. Excellent choice. Um, just going to the to the end of our of our chat, can you just tell me, are you working on anything like that right now? Do yes. you have anything um, coming up? Speak I do. I have a, you can just tell us everything. <laughs> I have a non-fiction book coming out in October, on October the 1st, about women in Greek myth, and that is called Pandora's Jar. Um, so when lockdown began, or just before lockdown began, I was editing that. Um, 
So that will be out in October. And I have just this week been able to announce um, that I'm writing two more novels for Pan Macmillan. I know, <laughs> I feel like that too. Um, the first will be Medusa and the second will be Medea. And I can show you without breaking it. I can show you Medusa that I have on my desk, um, a little Gorgon head. She's from the second century terracotta. She's a, she was present a few years ago. Um, so I have a little Medusa keeping me safe. She doesn't turn me to stone, she looks after me. <laughs> so yeah, Medusa next, Medea after that. So it's basically snakes and then child killing for me for the next three years, which honestly, I couldn't be happier about. I feel so bad. Oh, well, that's, um, yeah, well, if, if this is what you want to write about, you know. It honestly is, yeah, it really is. Brilliant. <laughs> I just hope it's going to do as well as this one. Um, so how do you feel about being shortlisted? Oh, Anything? yeah, I mean, it just feels, yeah, I still can't really believe it. When the, the copies came through with the sticker on that says shortlist, I, when it was longlisted for the Women's Prize, that sort of felt like the most miraculous thing um, because I judged the Women's Prize years ago, eight years ago, I think. Um, and so I know how much it, you know, it, it, there's, a, there's a huge element of luck involved. Your book has to meet the right judge on the right day when they're in the right mood for it. And, you know, you can be lucky and unlucky. And this year felt like my lucky day, big time. And then um, the long list party was just before everything stopped. And so it, it's like my last sort of night out before the world kind of paused. And then the shortlist message came through. I heard about three weeks before it was announced. Um, so everybody was locked down and so there was no one to celebrate with and so I, it was just it's like and I couldn't tell anyone because it's secret and so I just kind of sat here on my own like can this and then I'd I'd rung um Kate Moss because I knew her from judging the the prize before um I texted her and I just texted like five exclamation marks um <laughs> because I thought I'm pretty sure she must have been in the room but they're not in the room they've done it over zoom but she'll still know so so I just texted five exclamation marks and thought well I can't get in trouble for that and then said that and she rang me and for days I shouldn't really be saying this because I sound so lame but for days afterwards because I was so I, I had to look at my phone and realize that we'd spoken for like 10 minutes and I thought oh yeah if I'd imagined it she would have had to hang up sooner than that. <laughs> so, so it must be true. And I probably didn't. It's like, no, look at that. We talked for 10 minutes. It must be. And then <laughs> I would carry on, you know, for the rest of the day. And then that the next day. Like, it's definitely true. It's definitely true. Yeah, until the next day. Well, somebody would have said by now. <laughs> somebody, somebody would have told me. They would have taken me aside. So, yeah, it still feels like an impossible, magical um, dream is the truth of it and it well has that book okay. definitely deserves it in my 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 opinion Thank you it's, very much. it's brilliant it's i know i know i know about i know a bit about a uh, greek mythology as well so so it's it's it was it was it was a pleasure to read to find out um oh, the, the, so you know the, the the people who i know because you know you know them from different different sources but even if you do not know the quick mitts at all i think it's still a very riveting story of a war of the family um basically um suffering from war after that and what sort of horrible consequences someone's greed can 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 bring to everyone else not just themselves so i think it's definitely worth the definitely worth the price and i wish you all the best with your previous novels i'm hoping they're going to be as successful as this one i oh, can't wait you. to read them i can't wait to read them and uh, if you want to borrow the book it's available on our um digital platforms as well i will leave the links in the um in the description of this video as well so you can go and borrow those so thank you very much for joining me today natalie and uh, thank you very much for watching everyone and i uh, hope you enjoy the talk hope you will enjoy the book once you've read it please do read it it's really worth it and uh, all the best for everyone and thank you very much for watching and I'll see you um, another time for another video. Thanks.